And that is the beauty of what we are doing. Some of you are, who are joining us today are going to say, well, I've heard Emily talk before and I've heard her have these same uh, discussions and training and you may have, but it was probably at a conference uh, where you had you where you left your uh, business and you joined us someplace. Remember when we used to be able to do that? Well, we're, we're planning to do that again for our next conference next year. So we will be sharing the dates for you to save. But what we heard was that uh, once a year is not enough uh, to have these conversations and to support each other in such a crucial topic. And so we have been adding. Uh, sessions for our Echo Ties uh, to give uh, ways to share across the state. But uh, more recently, I've had a lot of administrators and um, new team members say that there's such a turnover in the folks who work with feeding in our facilities that we need an ongoing training. And so that's when I invited Emily uh, to come back Emily has joined us before, and we're starting these conversations back at the basics again. So some of you may know uh, all of the screens here, but we believe that with the variety of uh, abilities and immersion into this world, that what is uh, the really cool feature here is that we're recording them, first of all, so you can share them with others. And as new team members may come in, they can watch them virtually but also we're bringing in a case study uh, each time to really talk about what this means and to further, um, further enhance comprehension. And so, um, it, and the other part that is crucial is you all talking about it and asking your questions. And uh, so these, uh, these are recorded. The handout link is also where you're going to find the recording. The recording for this session which is session number two, and for session number one, which was part of our feeding conference and really focused on the administrator roles. The recording is there. When we look at the recording, Emily wanted to, we talked about starting with the big picture and what administrators need to know. Um, we realized that Emily comes from Louisiana where she's worked and developed statewide systems. We realize that some of you are a party of one and some of you may be working and joining us from early intervention and a Head Start program. And what does that look like? Because that's a pretty common model here for early delivery of these services. When we look at our freaks and con uh, conference, two thirds of the people who attended our conference were in early intervention, early childhood. And so we know who our audience is. Emily has received feedback from those conversations and we are having a discussion. The role of RSOI is in, um, in supporting you all with professional development. And the ECHO model is what we're following because it works. And the key word that you're looking at right here, our main why, is the word safe. Because we know that you are probably feeding kids, they're eating. We know that's something that has to happen in school. But the reason that we are talking about this, the reason that RSOI started a conference and is having these discussions is that people lost their lives, kids. And so wherever you are, our role is about professional development. And so we're stepping back and really looking at um, these conversations that you can have with your teams and bring back to us, knowing that we have other ways to continue this through our ECHO sessions and at our conference uh, coming up in April, we're adding sessions to our uh, annual conference and we can have breakout sessions at our town halls. So SAFE is what we're talking about. We are RSOI regional and statewide services uh, through a grant for, or, uh, from the ODE Department of Education, Linda Brown, who is our liaison uh, with ODE for uh, RSOI is with us today. We have wonderful support. Um, good morning, Linda. Caught you when you were putting a bite in your mouth. I'm good at that. Yeah. 
Uh, we uh, RSOI has been around for more than 35 years. So if you're catching something that's working for you, please tell people. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're reaching everyone. I am Deb Fitzgibbon, so my camera's not working today. I am here and we'll be monitoring the chat uh, for our series host, Emily. And Emily's going to uh, tell you a bit more about herself and jump in, but uh, Emily is on and uh, you can see her there. <coughs> to be part of these conversations. Again, this is a discussion. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself, type in the chat box, and I will be monitoring that. Uh, you will get 1.25 contact hours credit for today uh, for attending uh, and each session. If you registered for today, you will receive a, um, a survey. Uh, and then as soon as you answer those survey questions, uh, you're going to receive your certificate. So we want your feedback. Uh, please do. Uh, again, the next town hall for state uh, for a therapist is January 10th, where if we choose to, we can have breakouts and continue these discussions. Also mark on your calendar for our next course, number three, uh, using a team approach. Um, and it, uh, that's on January 20th. We are on Thursday mornings from 8 to 9.15 uh, Pacific. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen, uh, just giving you a bit of an overview of where we're coming from. This is a discussion. And we are so thankful to have Emily Homer as part of our discussion and uh, leading that. Emily, welcome back to Oregon. Okay, so I'm not seeing my screen. Do I need to reshare it? Uh, you do, because I okay. can't come up with mine. That's I do, but now I see your screen. Okay. Is everybody else, are we good to go? Okay, let's okay. jump. In. All right, well, you know, thank you for having me back. And I have to say, I'm super impressed that on the day before your holiday begins, you're here joining me to talk about this. Uh, so that's, that's wonderful. It makes me feel like this is something you're really interested in and that it's important. I kind of flip the name of my session for today because in the last three or four weeks I've, I've gotten some new information that I wanted to share with you so I changed it to pediatric feeding disorders what does it mean for school-based services and so that's what we're, we're basically talking about the same thing but framing it a little bit different I think you're pretty familiar with my disclosures I've shared those with you many times um, so in the past, and what we typically, when we talk about it, we use the term swallowing and feeding disorders to describe students who need these services in our school setting. It is a very clunky statement. I have to say when I'm writing, it's a lot to type in. Um, but, but what were swallowing and feeding disorders? Well, they included the children that have dysphagia, of course, and that's where that safe piece that Deborah was talking about comes in, the oral, the pharyngeal, or the esophageal phases. It also talked with, refers to children who fail to master self-feeding skills that are typical for what their developmental level and, and is and that they're not using developmentally appropriate uh, feeding devices. Um, you know, we, we see our, our three to five-year-olds that sometimes come to school still drinking out of a bottle. So that would be a child, you know, that would be a real red flag for a swallowing and feeding disorder. Uh, these children also often experience less than optimal growth or have behaviors that result in a limitation of the foods that they eat, food aversions, feeding jags, and things like that. It's also an effect on their weight and nutrition. We find that the delays or the disorders in their development result in uh, weight and nutrition deficits. Uh, these children often need special equipment, such as special bowls and cups and utensils, maybe positioning uh, adaptive chairs and things. They may have sensory concerns that limit the texture, taste, temperature, or color of the foods that results in a limitation of the foods that they eat at school. And they often need someone to assist them with eating, and that may be directives as to food choices or actually feeding them. So these are all the children that when we think about swallowing and feeding, this is what we've typically been talking about when we use that term. And some people say swallowing and feeding, some people say feeding and swallowing, but that's typically what we've been using. Well, there, there is some change in the air. Uh, the World Health Organization has, um, has an international classification of functioning disability and health. 
where they classify disorders. And they have now added pediatric feeding disorder as to one of their classifications. And it, the way they define it is an impaired oral intake that is not age appropriate and is associated with medical, nutritional, feeding skill, and or psychosocial dysfunction. So it's a very succinct way of defining pretty much what I just talked about in the previous two slides, but its focus is a little bit different. And so I want to go, I want to talk today about that, about pediatric feeding disorders and how they compare with what we've been doing, but also what do they mean for the schools and what does it look like in the schools? Um, so we're gonna learn what it is and how it is identified. We're gonna determine if it's different from swallowing and feeding disorders that we've been talking about for many years now. And we're gonna discuss if this new classification system will make any difference in how we identify and treat students with these disabilities, or even if we will. So throughout the, and this is very important for me to say, throughout this presentation, some of the information I shared is taken directly from a wonderful article that I really recommend you accessing uh, by Godet and Associates on pediatric feeding disorder, consensus definition and conceptual framework. It's just full of really great information. It's also taken from feedingmatters.org. I know you're all probably very familiar with feeding matters and uh, the section, what is PFD? And of course, we know that P Feeding Matters was very instrumental in getting this new classification. And it, of course, Feeding Matters is an organization by parents and for parents as a support. And they really were finding a need in getting a specific classification for these children and what they go through. And then there's a wonderful PowerPoint that you can also access online called Understanding Pediatric Feeding Disorders, Introduction to Assessment, Treatment, Planning, and, and Clinical Management. And I found a lot of that information really helpful too. So, um, you, you know, some of the information from these things is in this talk, but you also can access the additional information by going to these sites. So uh, the ICF defines a, a disability as an impairment which is a problem in body function or structure, activity limitation, which is the difficulty encountered in executing a task or an action, which I think we can see that in an eating difficult problem, participation restriction, a problem experienced in involvement in life situations. So when we talk about the children in our schools that have swallowing and feeding, you know, they often have an impairment and activity limitation and particip participation restriction. So the ICF framework emphasizes holistic understanding of the physiologic and functional impact that pediatric feeding disorder has, including the impaired mechanisms, the environmental barriers and facilitators, and an impact on participation in da daily family and community life. So these are this is the picture, the schema that they're using, the, uh, the four, the pediatric feeding disorder in the middle and the four domains on the side. And so we're gonna talk about each of these domains. And you're gonna find as we talk, you're, you're really gonna be able to plug in your previous knowledge and make it fit into it. I think they did a nice job of taking all those pieces and parts that we've been talking about and kind of compartmentalizing them a little bit. Um, the criteria they're using right now is a disturbance in oral intake of nutrients inappropriate for age, lasting at least two weeks and associated with one or more of the following. And I, I think that two weeks comes as, um, because a lot of the focus with feeding matters is with infants to two or three years old. And so if an infant is experiencing these things for at least two weeks, then, then it's a classification. In the schools, our children will be way beyond two weeks. But it's associated with one or more of the following of those four domains. So we're gonna start by talking about the medical dysfunction, okay? And the medical dysfunction is evidenced by impaired structure or function of the GI system, the cardiorespiratory system, and neurological systems that give rise to dysfunction through several mechanisms, including cardiorespiratory compromise during feeding, aspiration or recurrent aspiration pneumonia, 
aero digestive disease, primarily in very young children, and neurologic impairments such as cerebral palsy. So I think when we think about our children in the schools, we often can plug in a medical dysfunction. Uh, okay. So dysphagia itself would be a medical dysfunction. Uh, and so who helps to assess and treat the medical factors associated? Well, of course, it is the primary care physician primarily. They're the ones who are responsible for the initial identifying that this child may have a pediatric feeding disorder. And then they often have to facilitate referrals to other specialists. Um, because pediatric feeding disorder is very complex, it may require several subspecialists. And I think this is important for us in the schools because when we get these kids and we, we know they're working with a pediatrician, but we may see issues because we see these children so much that maybe hasn't been picked up by their physician, that we can help the parents to maybe seek out some help that they haven't previously gotten. So some of the other specialists that uh, may be called on would be a developmental pediatrician, a pediatric surgeon, allergist or immunologist, cardiologist, dentist, endocrinologist, gastroenterologist, geneticist, and, and so on. There's many, many specialists. And, you know, I can definitely see us making referrals, not referrals to, but actually talking to parents about dental work and things like that. The, uh, the um, gastroenterologist is one that we often talk to parents about. So what is it that the physicians do? Well, they identify when feeding needs further assessment. And I, I think that's a really important statement because um, they're not actually assessing the feeding. Uh, that is not the role of a physician, but they recognize that this child has a, a problem and needs further assessment. They also provide medical evaluation and tests to determine if there's any other conditions that might be affecting feeding or um, are uh, contributing to it in any way. And then they partner with other professionals to ensure a comprehensive evaluation is conducted. So if you're hearing this today, you are one of those other professionals that they should be contacting to look into this. Now, each of these divisions that I'm talking about is a special section on the Feeding Matters website of what is PFD. So you'll see the, the link in the bottom so you can look at it. Then comes the nutritional dysfunction. Okay, so remember medical is at the top, now nutritional is over here to the right. The students, we know that students with special needs are extremely high risk for severe undernutrition and dehydration. Students who are unable to take in enough nutrients or fluids to adequately provide them with what they need to access their curriculum. And we see that all the time, particularly in our very severe population. Children who eat a limited variety of foods or eat the same foods every day are also at risk for micronutrient deficiency despite adequate macronutrient. And as you read about these kinds of more behavioral type cases, you find that some of these children are growing, they're getting taller, they're gaining weight. Um, from visually, you'd say, well, yeah, they're doing fine. But then when they do a dietary write-up, a workup, they find that they are missing the micronutrients that are necessary for a healthy person. Uh, to really learn and, and to participate to their full ability. Um, so these are the children that, that have the very limited number of foods and this limits the amount of nutrition they get. It also will include children who are tube fed, who may be getting enough through their tube, but there's some that don't get enough through the tube or they get too much. Okay. And then there's our students with this ones with sensory disorders that limit their food choices as well. Uh, Emily, I just wanted to point out that what sure. Sarah, Sarah shared, she said that oftentimes that they are the ones who are sharing with the physician that they've noticed a problem and that there needs to be an assessment. And that was Sarah. Almost always, Sarah. I, 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 don't, unfortunately, and this is put together by Feeding Matters and I, I, they work with some absolutely outstanding physicians, but our day-to-day -day physicians aren't really investing a lot in feeding and in nutrition and, and what, you know, 
what these what's going on with these kids and, and to me in in my mission i think it's so important that we do this in the schools because we can share that information with physicians we live with these children for two meals out of their day you know so i think we have such an important role that way but you're absolutely right ideally physicians would be the drivers of this but often it's uh, the other way around i appreciate that comment um we know that nutrition is a foundation for growth and development. And regardless of how a child eats, it allows a child to, to thrive. It affects their brain activity and capabilities, their fine and gross motor skill development, and their overall health and wellness. All of these things are necessary for a child to be successful at school. So it's evidence, nutritional dysfunction is evidenced by malnutrition or undernutrition, including dehydration, specific nutrient deficiency, just like we just talked about, reliance on enteral feedings or oral supplements to sustain nutrition and or hydration. So we may have some children that uh, are able to eat orally, but need that supplemental tube feeding in order to get adequate nutrition. And so we need to be sure as um, clinicians and therapists working in the schools that if a child is too fed and they're able to eat orally, that we make sure they get the experience of both at school. So who can help to assess and treat the nutri nutrient, nutrition deficits. Uh, a registered dietitian nutritionist, RDN, is the recommended professional. They address growth and nutritional needs. Uh, they assess a child's diet to determine if they're taking the nutrients they need, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins and minerals, fluids and, category, and calories. Now, from a school point, point of view, um, we don't require we don't typically request a, a, a diet write-up or a diet study. Uh, that would be something the parents and the physician would do. Um, typically, our children are at school and they may be functioning in the, on their limited diet, but able to attend in school and that. And so that that's a little difficult. Uh, typically, I don't think we recommend that just because it's not our role. Feeding skill dysfunction is evidenced by the following. Now, here's the one, this is ours. This is what we know, this is our thing, okay? It's an impairment, impairment in oral sensory functioning or oral motor functioning, impairment in the pharyngeal functioning, delayed feeding skills that of course are not age appropriate, unsafe oral feeding, gagging, vomiting, fatigue, and inefficient oral feeding, these kiddos that take so long to eat their, their meals at school. So it all results in the need for some modifications, texture or liquid, uh, liquid or food modifications, uh, modified feeding, feeding positions or equipment, and modified feeding strategies. And that's why in the past, we've talked about the procedure and what we do to set up these strategies so that the child can eat safely and efficiently at school. Um, so learning to eat skillfully and comfortably is rooted in the development of sensory experiences of eating and the movement skills that make it possible. Uh, feeding skills and abilities include social communication, and interactive skills that integrate with meal times. So it's not just a spoon to a mouth. It, it's really everything. It's communication, it's social skills, it's um, the motor skills, it's everything. So who helps to assess and treat the feeding skills? Therapists with specialized skills in pediatric feeding assessment and management most often include speech language pathologist and occupational therapist. In addition, the physical therapist will assess positioning needs. Each specialty has expertise in one or more areas and may have participated in advanced coursework and training programs that provide them with an understanding of how to combine observation and treatment options in collaboration with the other professionals. So we know that as specialists, we you know that that we we may not even consider ourselves specialists, but we know about feeding and swallowing disorders. We've had some training in it, but we know that in order to really continue to treat this, we need to continue that professional development. We need to learn more and more 
about providing safe feeding plans for children, for treating their uh, feeding disorders, and really addressing, and as we can see when we talk about this new PFD, it's very broad. There's a lot of areas that will need to be addressed. And so that's gonna take a lot of uh, training for us to know exactly how we can help these children while they're at school, what we can do and what we can't do. So here's the things that therapists uh, working with uh, feeding skills domain uh, do. This is, this is what they do. And so um, they collaborate or assist with swallow studies. Now, this is something I really advocate for if you work in the school system to attend the swallow study when you make a referral for one so that you can help guide the study so that you can see what is happening so that you can help educate the parents during the process. Really important. So this collaborate or assist with swallow studies, I think is so important that the schools really get into that and make that part of their program. Improve skill movement of the mouth that leads to safe, efficient eating and drinking. Help overall movement coordination skills that support feeding development and develop better control of a child's body. Uh, we know that the whole body's involved in this. Help develop an overall movement coordination skills that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I already did that one. Provide strategies for improving coordination and overall muscle tone with a child's oral facial muscles and improving articulation. And we know that when we work on the child's oral facial muscles, uh, probably not as much for articulation, but for, for eating skills, for feeding, for chewing and swallowing, it does make a difference with these children and they do improve as long as it's intense and consistent. Um, and then we focus on, uh, fine motor skills to develop coordination and more the more precise movement between eyes, shoulders, arms, and hands. But that's not all therapists do. We also strengthen head and trunk control to provide the foundation for specific movements of the mouth, chest, abdomen used for breathing, eating, and swallowing. We determine if oral motor and or sensory, oral sensory problems are contributing to the child's feeding disorder. And then we propose strategies for improving sensory experiences of eating, strategies that incorporate all of the child's sensory senses in an organized way during meals. And we help children increase their comfort level when eating a wide variety of different foods and textures. So if you go home tired at night, this is what these last two slides, because you are doing all of these things to help children be safer and more efficient at school. And then we get to the last domain, which is the psychosocial dysfunction. And I think when we look at the term swallowing and feeding disorders, um, that might be the piece that wasn't included in our definition as much is the psychosocial part. And what that is, is the active or passive avoidance behaviors by a child when feeding or being fed inappropriate caregiver management of child's feeding and or nutrition needs, a disruption of social functioning within a feeding context, and a disruption of caregiver child relationship associated with feeding. So this one was a little hard for me to hear because in some ways we're, it sounds like we're blaming the caregiver or the parent for these issues, but basically what, what it's saying is that there there, you know, this is, there may be ways that people react to a child's feeding disorder that may not have been helpful, but certainly wasn't intentional or evil in any way. It was the best they could do at the time and based on what they knew to do and that kind of thing. And because these, I know you all have worked with people, children who are very difficult because they're so selective, it becomes very frightening and very um, uh, scary for a parent to think that their child is not eating. And so all of that can add to stress and distress. And I think that's why they added this psychosocial dysfunction piece. Uh, so it manifests itself in learned food aversions, stress and distress, disrupted behavior, food over, over selectivity, which means that they are picky. They only eat certain things a failure to advance to age appropriate diet despite of the adequate skills. So some of these children have adequate oral motor skills and, 
and swallowing mechanisms, but they're not advancing for a psychosocial reason. Grazing and then the caregiver use of inappropriate strategies. So when children are exhibiting challenging mealtime behaviors, they are expressing that eating is unpleasant or difficult for them. These behaviors can also often lead to caregivers and families feeling confused and frustrated, affecting the caregiver-child relationship, as well as the child's thoughts and behaviors toward feeding. So that's how they explain it. Um, so when I talk about these, not in the context of PFD, but in the context of swallowing and feeding, which is what I've been doing, I and I get to this, it, to me, it's real important to go back to that medical piece that if eating is unpleasant or difficult for a child, there's probably a medical piece contributing to it. And so that's where you have to look at the whole framework and say, well, okay, I'm seeing this, but let's look at that medical and, make, and see what's going on that way. So feeding specialists can work with the family and the child to better understand the reason for these struggles and to help improve the child's behaviors feeding behaviors to improve acceptance of foods and dreams. So direct feeding therapy is what they're talking about here. This will also include modifying caregivers' responses to the child's behavior to promote positive and successful feeding interaction. So I think that last statement is really important because um, what we found in my district is that when we worked with these children that had these really severe behaviors and we tried to progress their diet and move them to a greater variety of foods without 100% um, parent involvement, we were not able to see very much progress. So this type of uh, pediatric feeding disorder really, in, in, it, it is essential to have the caregiver working with the feeding specialist. So who is it that helps to assess and treat psychosocial dysfunction? Um, they say various professionals um, can treat it. Uh, mental health providers, uh, typically licensed professionals who can partner with other professionals on the treatment team to provide support for the child and the family. So the way I interpret this statement is that you, you do wanna pull in those mental health specialists uh, but it's also going to take the feeding team in, to also address it as well. Um, and in most cases, it could be a psychologist, a behavior analyst, analysis, uh, counselor, or uh, who all have special training in feeding. Uh, social workers can also be very helpful in helping families to connect with resources in the community that will help them to be uh, successful with feeding and with some of the other concerns. So what they do, they evaluate how both the caregiver and the child are responding to the feeding disorder. They evaluate mealtime behaviors and caregivers' responses to those feeding behaviors. They assess why the behaviors are concerning. Um, so probably they're looking at those things that I've talked about, the medical things as well. They determine how to motivate families and children to participate in the feeding process using various evidence-based behavioral strategies and they identify strategies that promote positive mealtime experience based on evidence and research. Um, so this is the role of the psychologist or the behavior analyst, analyst, why can't I say that word? Analyst, was, well, anyway, um, you know what I mean. Say it for me. Analyst. Analyst, that I was stressing the wrong, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Analyst. Oh, say it again for me. <laughs> Analyst. Analyst, thank you. Okay, so all of this proposed diagnostic criteria is in, in the absence of cognitive process consistent with eating disorders and apparent oral intake is not due to a lack of food. So these are not the children that do not have that are hungry and do not have food. And it's, it's congruent with the cultural norm. So you have to look at both of those things. Um, the students most at risk for pediatric feeding disorders in the schools are the same ones 
that are most at risk for swallowing and feeding disorders. So this is this list you've seen before. This is the same thing: the developmental disabilities, neurological disorders, neuromuscular, genetic syndromes, structure out in normalities, the sensory behavioral factors, complex mental condition, autism, and cognitive deficits. So there is no difference in that. Um, so before I talk about the signs and symptoms, uh, does anyone have a comment or a question that they wanna talk about before we move on? I'd like to ask Sarah to unmute herself. She just put a comment in the uh, chat and if she would okay. like to say that out loud, that would be great. Yeah, so I was wondering if at some point we can chat about the psychosocial effects of ADA and the BCBAs in school with regard to feeding. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that is not something that I necessarily specialize in. Um, I really, really go more towards establishing safety and that kind of thing. But I do understand that that is a, a topic that it really weighs on school based people on what the roles are. And so I would love to hear what you guys are seeing and what you're experiencing in your schools. And we can talk about that. We do know someone who across our state, you know, we look first in our state for the expertise, but if you know someone who has that, please let me know uh, so we can bring their voices to the table. But perhaps this is a good um, focus group discussion um, at one of our town halls. So thank you for bringing that up, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it would be because I think this is one of the things that, that people struggle the most with within the schools as to what, how much and how little to do, what can we do, how do we work for the with the BCBAs and that kind of thing. So I'm gonna go on and is, not, have, is it the fact that most people are not doing what would be considered therapy? And so uh, in, in the area of feeding, you know, it's all about- I'm, I'm not sure what Sarah is referring to. I, I know my experience has been that um, when you do this kind of feeding therapy, it's very intense and very time consuming. Um, I, I, I don't, Sarah, what were you? What were you We've referring? experienced some harmful practices with regard harmful. to ABA and the, and the BCBA's um, implementation. And we have um, sort of gone round and round um, with it. And we are really trying to strenuously advocate that it is not part of our students' um, school experience with regard to feeding. And uh, uh, by and large, it's been successful. But the problem is that we don't know who is receiving those services until we see it and we see that it's harmful, right? Um, because they're not even necessarily being placed on the IEP um, as a behavior support plan. And so when we catch it, we get to say, hey, time out. I wanna yeah. make sure that this is not harmful for the student and I wanna share why it is harmful. Um, and so we're just running into that more and more frequently because BCBAs are now in the school. They're flooding our schools. Wow. Wow. Okay. That would not be a conversation I'm going to have right now. Well, um, no, right now, but thank you for bringing that it That up. is a really important topic, I think. And I don't think it's just your state. I think no. other, I, I don't think everyone's doing what you're doing, but I think the concerns are um, around the whole country to a certain extent. Okay. So let's talk about signs and symptoms. I think it's important to really, uh, you know, we so often use those two words together as if they are synonymous or, but, but they're very different. Signs are objective measurements or observations of behaviors that can be observed. Okay. So a sign is something that we can see. And so most of the time, what we're seeing uh, in the schools are signs of a swallowing and feeding or signs of a pediatric feeding disorder. A symptom is the subjective experience of a potential health issues, and it cannot be observed by a doctor or by anyone else, such as pain or fatigue or thirst. You can't really uh, classify that. So we're going to talk about the signs because that's typically what we see. 
And um, so we may observe repeated respiratory infections, history of recurring pneumonia, choking, eyes watering, wet gurgle voice after meals, weight loss, difficulty chewing, prolonging feed time, open mouth. All of these things that we've talked about so much are the things that we see in the school setting that really give us a flat red flag saying this child has a swallowing and feeding disorder and now might use the term pediatric feeding disorder. Um, so the prevalence of pediatric feeding disorder in children with disabilities is very high. It's as high as 25% in our typical developing children, but it's 70% in premature children, 80% in children with developmental disabilities, and over 90% in children with cerebral palsy. We've talked about the under, I'm not gonna go into great detail with these because this is kind of the medical piece that we just talked about, the complex medical conditions and developmental disability, the neuromuscular coordination, the genetic syndromes, medication side effects can cause it, neurological disorders, sensory, structural abnormalities, behavioral factors, and socio-emotional factors. So these are all the things we've already talked about when describing pediatric feeding but they are the same things regardless of how you're framing it. So I thought it might be interesting to take some of our common children that we see in the school setting and plug in the domains. So you take a, a child with cerebral palsy, they're certainly gonna qualify under a medical dysfunction. They're gonna have dysphagia, uh, GI issues, aerodigestive disease. In the nutritional area, they're gonna be often undernourished or dehydrated. Most of our cerebral palsy children are gonna need our modifications, texture, positioning, uh, maybe equipment, things like that. And oftentimes they may, the family or the child will have stress or distress. Some learn feeding aversions out of fear or whatever when they uh, maybe choke on something. And so because of the complexity of cerebral palsy it sometimes leads to uh, inappropriate strategies used by caregivers. If you look at our neuromuscular disorders, such as muscular dystrophy, dystrophy or muscular spinal muscular atrophy, they too qualify under a medical dysfunction. They also are very, very high risk for undernutrition and dehydration. They also need texture modification, positioning, and modified feeding strategies. Much less often are, do they fall under the psychosocial dysfunction. And then our various syndromes such as um, Down or Mobius, they would be probably all of these. Now, if we looked at our children that were strictly psycho, that were pretty much psychosocial, I think you still probably, and I, I kind of wish I had have done one of those children, um, I think in a child that appears to be psychosocial, you're going to also have them qualifying probably for nutritional deficits, as well as some medical issues that may be rooted in the behavior or the psychosocial issues we're seeing. So I think the domain is useful in kind of looking at, well, let's not just put this child in this one area, let's see what else could be going on with that child. Um, so a child with Down syndrome can have problems with feeding or swallowing due to physical, medical, and behavioral issues. Uh, they often have low muscle tone, sensory problems, food refusal, low endurance, issues with oral motor skill development, and all of these add to a feeding disorder. So in the medical area, your Down's children are going to have an uncoordinated, may have an uncoordinated swallow, leading to choking, gagging, coughing, and often aspiration. They may have underlying respiratory or, or cardiovascular issues, and which may exasperate swallowing. Uh, in the feeding skill area, their low tone and poor oral motor skills uh, result in poor lip closure and low muscle tone, and that results in chewing difficulties. They may have issues with oral motor skill development and sensory problems. Uh, in psychosocial, it's, it's fairly common for a down child to have some food refusal and low endurance. All of those things result in dysfunction in nutrition and dehydration for those children. Uh, same with children with cerebral palsy, they're going to have many medical conditions, the oral pharyngeal as well as the esophageal, they're very high risk 
for all of these things. And these are the things you would want to really take a look at with these children to make sure they're all addressed, especially the esophageal issues that need a physician because that could really inhibit the progress we can make in the schools. Um, what I'm hoping is that with, the, with this new classification system, it will provide a new legitimacy for students with swallowing and feeding disorders. Um, it's resulted in some new ICD-10 codes uh, that are really a little more applicable to what we do in the schools. So they have the three and there's others. So I really encourage you to visit the site, uh, just feeding difficulties unspecified and then feeding, pediatric feeding dis disorder acute and pediatric feeding disorder chronic. So most of our children in the school settings will fall under pediatric feeding disorder chronic. Uh, so if you claim for Medicaid in your school districts, um, you, you know that uh, speech pathologists and occupational therapists and physical therapists can bring in significant dollars for their school system to help treat these children that are very expensive for districts to, um, to address. And that was the whole purpose of Medicaid billing in the schools is to help them cover the medical cost of treating these children in the schools. So with these more specific uh, codes, I feel that we will be able to really get reimbursed for the evaluations and the therapy that we do with these children uh, at, a, at a larger uh, rate, which will result in more money for the school districts, which hopefully uh, results in hiring more physicians, uh, therapists. So um, it provides a legitimacy to the services that are provided for children with pediatric feeding disorders in the school setting, in my opinion. Uh, and there is an increased responsibility for school administrators to recognize the disorder and acknowledge the risk to students at school, including the identification and treatment in their special ed programs. That is my hope. Uh, it may take OTs, PT, speech, nurses advocating for these services. Um, and I am realizing we, I am not going to get through everything here. Um, so I, we may have to pick this up somewhere else. I do have still 10 minutes, but I did want to talk a little bit, but, uh, I want you to know and understand that these are the three, uh, disorders of feeding that are recognized both by, um, Sorry, Emily, we yeah. have uh, reserved until 915 Pacific. Right, I was hoping to stop in time for the case, but we may just do the case quicker. We'll see. I'll just keep going. We'll okay. see what happens. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's talk quickly about ARFID. This is this is one of the reasons they wanted to get PFD so badly is because many children were being uh, coded as ARFID or being turned down because the only code really that applied would be ARFID, and that is an avoidance restrictive food disorder. And basically what ARFID is, is uh, a child who has the normal structure and function for, for feeding and swallowing, but don't eat. Okay, so it is a psychiatric disorder with anxiety, ideology, and a nutritional sequela. Okay, and it is part of DSM-5. Uh, it has a code. Anorexia nervosa, we're all very familiar with that. That occurs in older people and is a fear of gaining weight or body image problems. It too is a psychiatric disorder with dysmorphia ideology and a medical sequela. And then pediatric feeding disorder, we know what we just defined it as oral intake that's not age appropriate and the four domains, multifaceted with functional impairments impacting feeding. And they are in the process of revising the DSM-5. And at that time, PFFD will be added to it. So we don't have a number yet for that. So some children who were already identified as ARFID may need to be reconsidered to see if they really fall under PFD. I thought this was part of that PowerPoint that I referred you to. It's just a great way to look at it. So you can see with ARFID and pediatric feeding disorder, it's generally younger children older with the uh, anorexia. And ARFID is simply the nutritional comp compromise, whereas feeding disorder includes the medical and dysphagia and as well as the nutritional. Um, so it does need to be addressed in the school. Uh, we know how often children eat at school 
that if it's not treated, they're at risk for choking, aspiration, undernutrition, dehydration, social isolation, and denial of fate. Uh, the beautiful part is that in the school districts, we have multidisciplinary teams available to address this right there built into our school system. And so in, in the keeping with the pediatric feeding, we can work as a team uh, to address this. Now, I quickly want to talk a little bit about on, on, uh, nutrition. Uh, we know that it's a big risk factor for these kids. And um, we know that the nutrition really falls mainly with parents and guardians, but that in order for children to really participate in their curriculum, they must be adequately nourished and hydrated. Um, so undernutrition is the lack of proper nutrition caused by not having enough food or not eating enough food, um, containing the substances they need. And dehydration is when you use or lose more fluid than you take in and your body really doesn't have enough water or other fluids to do its normal functions. Um, so some of the common signs, loss of appetite, weight loss, tiredness, reduced ability to perform tasks, everyday tasks, reduced muscle strength, not being able to walk as far or as fast as normal. Uh, the person may be lethargic and depressed, have poor concentration, poor growth. And one of the beautiful things about addressing uh, pediatric feeding disorders or swallowing and feeding in the schools is that we can be the eyes and ears for these children. We can, we can recognize when nutrition is a concern and can follow up and do something about it. And I think we have a tremendous um, ability to make a huge difference with children who are undernourished, regardless of the reason that they are undernourished, because we're looking at it. Um, so we know that it's very serious. It, re it results in uh, slow growth and infections last longer. Um, they're really uh, at risk for stunted growth and development being permanent. Um, so I've talked a lot about the CP kids and their role. We know that they're at risk for this. Um, they pretty much do all follow the same as the others, the growth failure, the immune function and all of that. So we skip over that. Same with spinal muscular atrophy. Um, their most common problems are choking risk, difficulty conveying food to the mouth and chewing difficulty. These really result in nutritional de deterioration over time, energy, protein, and vitamin intakes or inadequate in a, in a study done. And underfeeding was highly prevalent with two feeding, but also so was overfeeding. So uh, there needs to be the happy meeting. We know the signs of dehydration, thirst, dry, sticky mouth, decreased urine, dry skin, no tears, sleepy or, or uh, lightheadedness, dizziness, rapid heartbeat and breathing difficulties. Um, as a result, there may be involuntary muscle contractions and loss of consciousness, a drop in blood pressure, short-term muscle damage and constipation. So what do you do if you suspect undernutrition or dehydration at, with a student in your school? First of all, contact the school nurse. The nurse will take responsibility for determining if it's an issue and talk to the parents. If it's determined that a child is undernourished, following the procedure that we've talked about in the past will be very helpful. So I really encourage the school team to educate school staff on the signs of and symptoms of undernutrition, use the procedure that we've talked about that um, really encourages a, a efficient food plan so that the child can eat enough food during the day to keep a daily feeding log if there's a concern about that and to have the school nurse weigh the student regularly when there's a concern of undernutrition. So I want you to Take a few minutes to think about your thoughts of um, pediatric feeding disorders. We have, let's, let's talk about that now, and then I will do the case study, which shouldn't take the whole 15 minutes. So now's a time that I'd really like to see what your thoughts are on this and uh, how you're feeling. You guys are usually really good at sharing. As I said earlier, Emily, we know that part of the, the, the conversation and just having this uh, discussion and training um, 
it is a ripple effect. And so making sure that you are able to share the handouts and videos, maybe some yeah. later. I'm just wondering if they see the new classification as something different or there's something they've already been aware of and have kind of already shifted how they identify kids to use this, or do they feel maybe it doesn't really belong so much in the schools as in early childhood and private feeding? Just wondering where their thoughts are going. Okay, then we will move on. <laughs> All right, so in this case study, we're gonna talk about Larry, okay? So I want you to meet Larry. Larry was a severely impaired student who is in a wheelchair and has very low cognitive and communication skills. He relies on an assistive technology device for very basic communication, as well as using some general gestures to, to communicate with his teachers and that. He had been in our school district for quite a while, but he had never been referred to the swallowing and feeding team. For this, I really don't, I don't know why, uh, because entering high school, he was entering a high school, and so he had been with us, but had never been referred. Uh, he was in a class for severe profound students and was staffed with a teacher and three paraprofessionals. They did not know Larry prior to starting the school year, okay? However, the OT that was assigned to that high school, she had known him from middle school and stated that he had a history of neglect in terms of cleanliness and care. So he was referred to the swallowing and feeding team because he was so uh, underweight. He seemed undernourished, lethargic, sleepy, wasn't urinating much. Uh, he was not uh, toilet trained, so they would change his diapers. and. Um, they just noticed that he just didn't seem to be doing well. Uh, so the swallowing and feeding team began the process of identifying his concerns. The parents were notified, but offered, they offered minimal information and often did not respond. So it took a lot of calls and a lot of trying to get to the parents to even get any response. They did find that the most effective method of communicating with the mother was the classroom teacher who sent a notebook back and forth to the parents and then inconsistently the parent would respond to that. The parent interview was never completed and, and the parent was never interviewed. So the team went on to do the interdisciplinary observation, which as you know, is the clinical evaluation. Um, the SLP and OT did it uh, in the cafeteria with the student. The PT had already uh, positioned him to make sure he was in his chair, he ate in his chair and make sure his position was right. And the nurse was um, on consult. Uh, so the team really did not observe signs of aspiration or parental involvement. They did notice some minimal oral motor concerns that might make him a little more efficient when he ate. So they re rec recommended a soft and bite-sized diet for him and increasing the student's food intake. So uh, they recommended large milkshakes uh, to see if they could address the nutritional issues as well as continue to try to correspond with the family. They felt that they needed a modified barium swallow study just to rule out silent aspiration because of the child's condition. Larry was frequently absent. So he would attend two or three days of school and then he would miss the next three days of school or four days of school. So when, um, when he was at school and they were feeding him and um, giving him the milkshakes and he frequently would point to his uh, wrist at, for eating, which was a symbol for eating, uh, signal for eating, uh, he, he would start looking better and feeling better and interacting more. So the team really suspected neglect because he, you, it just seemed to be making a difference, the food. Um, so whenever he gestured with the watch, they gave him food. He had many signs of undernutrition and dehydration, but really no signs of pharyngeal or esophageal dysphagia. He had weight loss. His clothing was very loose on him. He was tired, often put his head down on his um, arm in his chair. He had a, really a reduced ability to do his everyday task at school. So he, he just really had almost no energy to 
to use his device, his assistive device. There was reduced muscle strength um, that uh, he could barely lift his arms at times, a lot of thirst and dry, sticky mouth, and as mentioned before, decreased urine outlet output. So the team recommended the referral uh, because they wanted to rule out the aspiration, but it took the mother over a month to agree with it. In fact, we weren't sure we would ever get that physician script, but eventually she did agree for the swallow study. And um, we accompanied them to that study. And what we saw was that he really had a perfect pharyngeal swallow. There were no concerns whatsoever. So he was definitely not aspirating. He did have a mild oral motor deficits, but his oral and pharyngeal, uh, his pharyngeal and his, um, that's a mistake, his pharyngeal and esophageals seemed to be operating within normal limits. So Larry was clearly a case of undernutrition due to neglect. The school reported the parents to Child Protective Services. Uh, as you know, we are mandatory reporters. And the parents ended up enrolling him in a residential program where he was taken care of and fed. And, you know, the school staff that worked closely with him were actually sad to see him go, but were very relieved to know that he would be in this residential setting where he would receive adequate nutrition, he would be clean and taken care of. Uh, so we no longer had him, so we can't update that, but from what we understand, he was really taken care of. So let's look at the four domains um, involved in um, uh, Larry. He definitely had the medical component, his severe disability. Uh, he had a nutrition, he was definitely undernourished and dehydrated at times. Uh, he had minimal feeding skills adjustments that needed to be made, but they definitely um, were adapted and it helped him to eat uh, more food more efficiently during school. And then he had that psychosocial piece where the caregiver was not able to really um, give him what he needed in terms of support with food and we, we don't know enough about that parent to know what they were going through, but what, whatever it was, uh, that parent was not able to take care of this child. And so that would be the psychosocial. Now, where we fell short, um, I feel, in looking at Larry's case, is that, you know, we really should have called in the school nurse, which I don't have any record of that happening. Um, the school nurse should have been the one driving this effort. And um, instead, you know, the teacher tried and the speech therapist and the OT, the three of them worked together to, to make it all happen, which was good. But I think the school nurse really should have been involved. So we had a little breakdown in our teaming. And, and I think that's important um, to hear because um, schools are real places and they don't always follow the ideal list of what should and shouldn't happen. So um, I think we could have done better that way. Um, but because we were able to identify this child's nutritional and hydration deficits and dysfunction, he was able to get help. And that's really good. Um, okay, so that really brings us to the end of the presentation. And um, I'm, I'd really love to hear some comments. Sarah, you're muting once again and, and making your comment. Yeah, I just think that it's really nice to see the visual and to be able to place and chat about case studies in that way with regard to pediatric feeding disorders. And I also think that it's um, very validating to for the families, for the professionals that work with um, children with feeding disorders to see it in the manual, right? We work really hard for these kiddos and it's nice to see it actually validated and not be piecemeal together. Um, and I like the way that this um, lays it out, you know, visually so that you can look at it in that way instead of, like I said, just piecemealing it together. I did too, Sarah. I felt that it kind of separated it and put it in a way that made a lot of sense where we, you know, one of the things I do is talk about procedures so that we don't miss any steps or anything, but this kind of 
works the same way in that it organizes so we don't overlook any one area um, when trying to identify it, that we make sure we think about all of these things. So I, I really do like that part of it very much. And I'm hoping, how do you guys feel? Do you feel like it will give more credibility to your administrators, that they will be more willing, knowing that it's in the DSM as well as ICD-10, be willing to really consider this? Because I still hear administrators saying it's not educationally relevant, you know, <laughs> they're uh, afraid to do it, uh, they think it, they'll be sued. And so I'm still hearing that pullback from administrators. So I, I'm really hoping that this will help legitimize the whole thing. Do you guys think that might happen? I, I hope it happens because I know that um, probably about 90% of my referrals lately have been those psycho, psychosocial kids. The kids who won't eat, the kids who can eat but won't eat um they're still on the bottle wow and so and and that's where i think administration that i've been dealing with are good with the safe practices it's those psychosocial things that they say well it's just part of their syndrome or their autism or whatever yeah. so i really like that that psychosocial piece has been really drawn out. I think you're right, Vicki, in that when we talk about the medical, the nutritional, and the feeding skills, those all relate to safety at school. And of course, schools are more likely to react to that because they don't want a child to get harmed. But then when you look at the, the psychosocial piece, again, like you're saying, they'll say, well, it's just part of what they do. But when you break it down and, and they're eating only five foods all the time, that is not going to be a healthy child. There's no way, you know. So what this will do, and, and I, it's something I do uh, struggle with, and I, I don't know if you, you guys do, because uh, it sounds like you have a lot of these kids, uh, how you can make a difference progressing their diets. Have you had success doing that? What, what do you do with these uh, psychosocial kids that are just food averse or um, have complete refusal or only eat specific foods? At, uh, what, what I do in, in my situation with the kids I work with is just, you know, keep offering, keep but not pressing. And, um, <coughs> and once in a while we get more where I'm having a breakdown and I think it'll be good to um, have this to show is the parents are saying, well, they're a healthy weight, even though they might not be. And, you know, all the kid is eating is Chex Mix and um, goldfish crackers and an occasional um, McDonald's French fry. You know, <laughs> and, right. and it's like, but Oh, he's average age, but when you look at that child next to a typically developing, my one of my students is 10 years old, we look at him and go, um, I don't think that, I do think that it's having, you know, problems with his nutrition and weight gain and all that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've got a, a, um, a student that is 15 and is the size of a, like a seven-year-old. Wow. And yeah. And so it's like, and that part of it is the parents just saying, well, if he'll eat this, at least he'll eat. Yeah. And, and I think it is, um, uh, it, it does put the schools in a difficult situation to a certain extent, because um, if the child is, accessing the curriculum, he's social to the extent that he is, um, then they're going to say, well, why are we working on this? What, what is the point? Why aren't, um, you know, if they can make it through school and learn, then it's really not for the school to do. How do you, how do you guys feel about that? Well, 
Well, I think we need to ask what access means. Does it mean they're parked out in their classroom? Does it mean that they're they have yeah. enough interest to be engaged, right? To um, go in their stander or to do the things that they need to do um, from a motoric uh, perspective. So I think we need to challenge, you know, the term access or um, education or you know curriculum. Um, and it starts with nutrition and feeding. I mean, it's the first. I keep I say this over and over. It's the first thing we do when we're born, right? So regardless of where they're at, school or home, um, it's it's paramount, right? So um, you can't you cannot do anything else, whether it's just being parked out in the classroom or you know going to art class and you know direct selecting or using um, finger paints, right? I think. Um, I think we need to challenge that phrase or that word. Yeah, and you, can't, you can't access your your academics if all you're thinking about is food and being hungry. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a, a basic, it's one of those basic needs that need to be addressed um, in order for our students to even get to, you know, that cognitive level of learning um, or participating in a uh, an activity at school. Right, and, and one of the things I've seen with these, these kids with selective diets is <coughs> the meltdowns in, you know, like an hour after they eat or an hour and a half after they eat because they're hungry, and but it's not time to eat. And so, um, I mean, we do have a lot of behavioral meltdowns when the students are you know, not getting the nutrition they need. Hmm. Now, is referral to medical something you guys do on a regular basis with these children to rule out any medical conditions that may be causing the food selectivity? I mean, I really believe strongly in that. And the literature, if you, if you read it, often there's uh, gastrointestinal issues with these children that are classified autism you know, and um, so it, it really takes a, a team. I, I think it's a difficult thing for schools to do, um, to progress those foods without all this other information that they need, you know. And sometimes, without support from the parents or the caregivers. Right. And sometimes I feel like the schools are a little um, nervous to refer out to like private speech therapists because if they do, they might be responsible for paying for that because they should be able to support the student fully at school. But I don't see with this emphasis on psychosocial and the importance of it, um, I don't see how we can't, with the limited amount that um, school teams are able to, they're already stretched pretty, pretty thin, um, the minimal amount of pa parent contact and collaboration and teaming, um, these students with restricted food intake and different and diets really need people to be steadily providing exposure across the board and at home it's so important they're eating dinner and you know how many days a week and on the weekends and so that just that consistency and um, parent education if it can't be done in the school which I, I, I can't imagine it can be um, at a high level to support the efforts that we would be making. Um, I, I just worry that we're not getting enough referring out to private therapists who have feeding experience to support. Courtney, I completely agree with that. And we, we really tried in my district to address it. And we, after two years, we found that we were not making a difference. We weren't able to progress those children's diet because of what you said. You know, we have minimal contact with parents. We can't get parents to, they can't, we can't tell them to do anything at home. They have to decide to do it. Um, but one of, the, one of the things you said about the referral to a private feeding specialist, I think that that can be done. You just have to be very careful about the wording, okay? So you can't say, I recommend they go to a feeding specialist because you're right. Then the school system would, anything we recommend, we have to provide. You can say, and let me make sure I'm careful here, um, that uh, there sometimes are other paths you can take to help these children. You might wanna look into, are there any medical conditions? You might look into, are there any special therapies that might help them? Uh, because right now they're consuming adequate calories at school, 
but it seems like there's still issues, you know? So you want to just say, we're not really recommending this, but we're suggesting that there might be other things you could do, but you have to be careful. And, and Sarah, I saw you do thumbs up. So how would you word that? We chat frequently with the families and physicians just in general. And so we might, we might ask the family if it would be okay if we chat with their primary care provider. I mean, we've already got the ROI, but we always give them the courtesy. And then we may chat with the primary care provider and say, this is what we're seeing at school. Um, what do you think? And might we take a look at, you know, a feeding referral or a, a barium study, X, Y, Z, so that it's coming from the, the pediatrician and not from us. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good. I was going to jump in here too. Just, I mean, those steps are great too. And then you sometimes have situations where the parents won't sign the release of information. Right. Um, and so we fall back on the legalities, the liability issue of that. And we've had at San Kaiser a number of times where we've had to, you know, I, we lay it all out there for them of, you know, this is about health and safety. Um, you know, we are training lay people to, to do the feeding with your students, with your child. And, you know, this is not deemed safe in this setting. And, you know, I've had some pretty intense um, interactions with some of the parents who have been angry. But again, I remind them, you know, it's about your child's safety. Um, this, you know, we need doctor's orders. And I'm a school nurse. So, yeah, we do the weighing of these kids. I get pulled in all the time on, on these okay. students. So we're, so we're watching closely. That's why that collaborative approach um, for a feeding team is so important. So important. But, yeah. you know, I've got a couple situations right now where parents are out there working with their health care providers and, um, you know, I've said, I'm not going to progress anything in your child's diet until I can see that it would be safe. We've even met with this, uh, talked a little bit to the SLPs in the community who do a lot of the swallow studies and said, you know, it's great if you're doing a trial, you know, changing a, a student's um, texture, liquid consistency, but we're not going to do a trial in the school setting. We want to know when Everything looks great for the student. It's deemed safe. The healthcare provider is giving me an order that says it's safe, and then we'll move forward on that. So, okay, so uh, we're about done here, and I want to not to do an advertisement, but you know, we finished off talking about teaming, and that's what we're going to talk about next time in January. We're going to talk about. Um, working as a team. And, and like I said, in, in our district, which we've been doing it for 25 years, it's still a challenge. So teaming is a challenge. And I think there's things we can talk about to see what we can do to make it better for you and for your students and for everyone else. So I, I encourage you to join us then. And I want to thank you for taking the last day before your Christmas break uh, to be here with me. And I wish we could continue this discussion, but we are all out of time. Deborah, thank you. Thank you, and I'm going.